Hey, welcome back everyone. All right, our next presenter is Stan Romanak. All right, that name might, uh, might ring a bell with everybody because uh, Stan's case is really a big one. And we took a real in-depth look at it all the way back in, I think, 2004. And uh, it's, it's as valid today as the day it was done. Four full hours on his case with Stan and Deborah Lindemann and Dr. Jack Kasher and Dana Tebow. Major presentation. Why? Because it's a major case. It has everything. It has photo evidence, video evidence, witnesses. And here's the thing. Rock solidly established, I think, 2004. But guys, there's been stuff happening all the way from 2004 until this very day. Get ready for a ride. Please welcome Stan Romanek. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. First of all, first of all I want to thank everybody for coming here. Let me share my story. Um, those of you in the intelligence community, I hope you're having a good time. Um, those of you that are off-world visitors, thank you so much for visiting us, and I hope you're having a wonderful time also. Um, I've got a lot to go through, um, so I'm going to get started because we have little time. I can literally do probably a week presentation if I wanted to. Um, I want to start out, first of all, by putting things into perspective. There's something I'm sure some of you didn't know. Um, first of all, our solar system resides in the Milky Way. That's what we think, right? Our sun is one of about 200 billion suns in the Milky Way. Um, we're located on the outer edge of an outer, um, the outer reaches of a spiral arm called the Orion Arm. Two thirds of the milk, uh, two thirds the way from the galactic center, or so we thought. Scientists have now determined that the Milky Way is actually not our parent galaxy. And there's a reason I'm telling you this. We're from another galaxy called the Sagittarian Dwarf Galaxy. It, um, the Milky Way actually swallowed it up. And people wanted to know, you know, there was this big debate why the, the Milky Way looks kind of crooked and now they're thinking this is why. Um, a little schematic here of where the Sagittarian is and where the Milky Way is and where we are. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because it was speculated that there are about 200 billion stars in our galaxy. They now believe that there are over 400 billion stars with the combined galaxies. NASA researchers that I've talked to are saying that there are over 300 billion galaxies in the universe that they can detect with the Hubble Space Telescope. Honestly, to think we're the only ones would be absolutely the most ludicrous thing in the world. That being said, let's get started. <clears throat> June 6, 1968, my father served in the Air Force. This is probably when my experiences started to be honest with you. I was five years old at the time. My, um, we were stationed, my dad was stationed in Grand Forks, North Dakota. <clears throat> and he worked between Grand Forks and Minot, North Dakota. He worked at the missile silos. Well, in 1968, they had an incident where a UFO dropped down on one of the missile silos and actually armed one of the missiles. Now, this is public record. You can uh, get this information on the internet. You can find out about this yourself. But what they didn't tell you is they tracked the UFO to a small town called Northwood, North Dakota, where it hovered over the water tower there in our small town. Now, my brother remembers seeing my dad with a small detail surround this water tower, and um, the UFO eventually went away. This is supposed to be the actual, an actual photograph of that particular UFO. 
I don't know, this was sent to me, I don't know if this is real or not, but it's supposed to be. And I remember after that incident, we started getting bottled water. Yeah, bizarre, huh? <laughs> February 22nd, 2010, this is just recently, I got a call from the son of a general. This general, I promised him I wouldn't mention his name, but this general worked, was in charge of Minot, North Dakota when my dad was stationed there. He wanted to tell me um, about some other stuff that happened in the 60s. He wanted to tell me that they had an incident where um, they tracked a UFO in 1966 um, down to one of the missile silos, and it, it kind of flew over some B-52s. Now, these are supposed documents I just got sent by this general. He's really ill. His son told me that he's not doing well, and he wanted to get this information out that he's been holding on to for quite some time. So you guys are the first to see it. I wished I had time to let you guys read it, but I don't. I'm just showing you that I have it. Um, this is one of the witness reports. The MPs um, actually took a picture. This picture is... First time ever seen by the public. And there's the picture of the UFO over Minot Air Force Base in 1967. <clears throat> so 66, 67, 68, they had all this UFO stuff. And this is about when I had my first experience. And this is pretty important because this gets weird. This woman came up to me <clears throat> when I was five years old. I was playing with my pedal car. It was a summer day. And I remember she was very strange looking. Even as a five-year-old child, I thought she was very pretty. Except her eyes were different, very slanted, almond-shaped, baby blue eyes. In fact, they weren't even baby blue. They were almost day glow blue. And I remember she patted me on the head and told me that I was special and I had something to do when I got older. She opened her hand. <clears throat> when she opened her hand, I remember she had three fingers. The marble started to glow. It was, a, it was a glowing marble. And to me, it looked like a glowing version of the earth. And it started levitating about a quarter inch off her hand. Well, this, um, you know, I talked to Paula Harris. Paula Harris is a good friend of ours. And she was talking to me about uh, Maurizio Cavalla in, in uh, Italy took some Polaroids of somebody he calls the Clarion people. Well, this reminded me of this strange woman that I saw. I mean, it looks almost exactly, except, you know, she wasn't blurry when I saw her. But the same kind of weird eyes, the skinny features, and this is what I remember. This same woman followed me throughout my uh, childhood. We moved from North Dakota um, I was born in Denver, moved to North Dakota when I was really young, then moved back to Denver. Uh, and in between there, we, we, my dad had, was stationed for a little while in Cheyenne, and she was there the whole time. The last time I saw her, I was up at a playground. I was about 10 years old, waiting for the swimming pool to open at the local park. She came up to me, and she started talking, and I was swinging on swings, not paying attention. And I looked up, and she said, you're one of us. We're you. And I looked at her, I said, why would this, you know, being 10 years old, that's really unusual. But what got me was the fact that her mouth was not moving when she told me this. Now, as a kid, you kind of don't put two and two together. You kind of blow it off. Until December of 2000, I had my first real sighting. I didn't believe in this stuff. I thought anybody that believed in this stuff was crazy. I wanted them to stay away from me. But I met somebody online. She lived in Nebraska. I lived in Colorado. And, you know, I wanted her to come visit me. We became really good friends. You know, we were kind of dating this long-distance relationship. And I'm thinking, you know, what's the best way to do that? Well, I decided to go up to uh, what is known as Red Rocks Amphitheater, a very well-known spot up in the foothills of Colorado. Beautiful. They have concerts there. <clears throat> and I was going to videotape the surrounding area. This was about... December 27th, beautiful winter day, snow on the ground, perfect setting. And I was going to mail this videotape to her, and I was going to, you know, I was going to send her some flowers or something. Um, I never made it to Red Rocks. 
onto the side of the road, there were about 30 cars pulled off to the side of the road. And if you look, you can see the power lines. Behind the power lines, you see what's known as Dinosaur Ridge, and behind that is Red Rocks. Above the power lines, oh, I'd say probably a good anywhere from 60 to 200 feet, kind of hard to judge distance when you're afraid. There was an object, and when I saw this object, all these people were looking south, and I looked to see what they were looking at, and this object was hovering above the power lines. I'm thinking, man, that is the weirdest hot air balloon I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> well, it turned out not to be a hot air balloon at all. It turned out to be a UFO. In fact, when I got close to it with my van, it started pacing my van. I remembered, even though I was scared, I got a little brave because, you know, there were people around. I was going to try to outrun it, but, you know, you <laughs> Yeah, good luck there. I pulled off to the side of the road and I got my camcorder out and I started videotaping this object. Well, the object reorientated itself and literally shot to about a thousand foot in a blink of an eye. Now, growing up in the Air Force, I remember as a child the jet fighters would fly over us early morning and they'd create these sonic booms everywhere. Well, that's what this object did. It made no sound until it popped away and it made this sonic explosion that I felt could feel in my shirt. There were a bunch of people there. We all watched this object. It morphed, it changed shape, it did all these weird, bizarre things, and eventually corkscrewed away. I remember standing there with one of the guys, and about 10 minutes later, two F-16s flew the same direction as this object corkscrewed away to. This is what I thought I saw. I remember, as I got close to this object, looking in between these, these spheres, and these spheres were rotating counterclockwise under this bigger object was the blackest black I'd ever seen in my life. In fact, even today, I've never seen anything that black. It looked like if I got close, I could have thrown a rock into infinity. Um, now, even more amazing is, well, the local news did a report. Hopefully you can hear the sound. A UFO sighting near Red Rocks no sound, Sunday right after the sound. X-Files on Fox 31 News. A Lakewood man seeing something unusual in the sky grabs his video camera. I noticed something kind of just right above the power lines. A UFO, an expert says. This is nothing like any other UFO video I've seen. Judge for yourself. Sunday on Fox 31 News at 9 o'clock. I became the UFO guy. I mean, I started, I got to know these people personally because I started having so many experiences. Shortly after the news report aired, I was contacted by um, someone that was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base. Well, I didn't know this, but somebody at Nellis had tracked this same object. <laughs> that are ground-based, and they follow the flight of these you know, fighter planes as they were doing dogfights to you know, track what they're doing. Well, this UFO came on to their, into their airspace, and they captured this thing. Now, that would have been fine with me. I, you know, I didn't really believe in this stuff. I, I got it on video. And I was, you know, I still wasn't sure. I didn't know what, I, what to think. You know, could it be some military experiment? I wasn't sure. Um, I had some business in Pennsylvania. This was September 1st, 2001. Um, I decided to pick up my girlfriend, well, she's my wife now, um, Lisa, and we went to Pennsylvania with my best friend. On the way back, we were followed. Now. I'm not the first one to spot this, my wife did. I don't know if you can see that little white dot, but we were followed through two and a half states, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, by a large disc. Every time we pulled over to try to get video of this thing, the darn thing would pop into a cloud, and we were playing this cat and mouse game through those states, and I was getting concerned. And you know, we were kind of comical. We were driving 80 miles an hour down I-80 with our heads sticking out and a camera going like this, and people were looking at us. But that's the only way we could actually get any video of this thing. And it only got weirder and weirder and weirder. September 20th, 2001, I was working, I was managing a store, and I was about to close 
the store for the evening, you know, it was time to go home, and I just let my last customers out. Before I could lock the doors, they came running back in. They said, there's something above your work, there's something above your work. Well, the first thing I thought was, ah, somebody's crawled on the roof and they're playing some kind of game, who knows. I went outside to look above the roof and they pointed up toward the sky and I see this sphere, this red, big red blinking sphere, approximately 40 foot in diameter. Must have been anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 feet up. It was just staying there. And I'm looking at this object. Eventually, it slowly floats away. And I'm, you know, I've already seen, what, two UFOs now? I'm getting a little paranoid. Well, I go home. My friend and my sister were waiting for me. We lived in an upstairs apartment. I run upstairs, get my camera. I said, come outside, come outside. Because this thing followed me from my work. And it was just right above the apartment complex. So now I'm really paranoid. Well, I go up there, I get my camera, and by this time it's off by some cloud and you can barely see it. I get some footage of it, but you know, we talk about it. I don't even think if we ever, we were supposed to go to dinner, I don't think we ever even made it to dinner. But my friend leaves, goes home about 11 o'clock. I go to bed, my sister goes to bed. I was woken up two o'clock in the morning by a knock at the door. Now, this drives me crazy. I don't know why they keep using this. It's just got so many holes. The debunkers, all the TV shows will tell you if you have an abduction experience, it's sleep paralysis. Come on, you know. They don't explain how Betty and Barney Hill could have been taken out of their cars. They don't explain how Travis Walton could have been taken up at Snowflake, Arizona. My first abduction, I was fully awake when this happened. There was no sleep paralysis. I was not hallucinating. I got up to answer the door. My sister had already answered the door. She was standing there literally with this dumbfounded look on her face, staring at the ceiling like she was still asleep. While there were three people outside, and I thought they were, you know, I thought they were teenagers or something. I wasn't exactly sure because they were smaller. And I got close and I'm looking at them. It's like, what the? Why are they wearing costumes? And those are the most bizarre masks I had ever seen in my life. Well, the first thing I thought is, oh my God, they're going to rob us. They're here to rob us. I'm yelling at my sister, don't let them in. They're going to rob us. Don't let them in. And, you know, it's interesting because these are not your typical ETs that, you know, people talk about. They aren't the little gray guys. Um, there was a female and two males. And you could tell she was a female. She had female parts, which is unusual, too. They also didn't have normal extraterrestrial eyes. They didn't have the black, black eyes. Their eyes were massive, massively huge, almond-shaped, wrap-around, day-glow blue, baby blue. I can't describe the color eyes. While the female pushed my sister aside like she was unconscious, came in, grabbed my wrist. And you know, unless this happens to you, this is really hard to explain. A thought popped into my head. It's going to be OK. You're fine. We're not going to hurt you. Uh-uh. The thought, no, uh-uh, it wasn't mine, and it's not going to be OK. I flipped out, or I tried to flip out. She grabbed my wrist, and she started leading me to the balcony. Well, somehow I snapped out of whatever trance I was in, and there was a male on either side of me, and I grabbed one of the males, and I was going to throw him off the balcony. Well, guess what? It didn't work. I felt a tap on the back of my head, and that's the last thing I remember, other than waking up. Wherever this, I can't tell you if it was a craft, I can't tell you if it was a room in a basement, but it was like some place I'd never seen before. Unfortunately, I don't have, to, you're going to have to get the book to find out. I don't have time to tell you, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is what I thought the female looked like, although, you know, honestly, I can try to draw this or have somebody draw this every which way, and I still can't get it quite right. Now, because I didn't believe in this, I, you know, it's not that I didn't remember because I remembered everything. I just, my brain couldn't handle it. So I convinced myself this was a dream. I got up in the morning, 8 o'clock the next morning, after my experience, thinking, man, this is the weirdest dream I ever had in my life got up to make some breakfast for myself, and my sister goes, what the heck happened to your back? I wasn't wearing a shirt, I was just wearing shorts. And I felt around on my back, and I didn't feel any pain, but I felt these holes in my back, and it felt kind of wet. 
And I'm looking, it's like, what the heck? And when I looked down, I noticed that I had hair missing on, the, on my wrist. And I had these open wounds on my wrist. Well, I really started to flip out. I'm, I was having a really hard time with this. Got a hold of my friend. My friend said, look, you're gonna work, let's get you hooked up to your local UFO organization and maybe they can help you and figure this out. Well, we got, I got involved with the local UFO organization. They started documenting everything. One of the things we noticed that these wounds that were open wounds actually healed in less than 48 hours. Probably more like maybe 40 hours to nothing but these tiny little scars. One of the researchers involved with my case now said, you know, look, if you've been abducted, a lot of times if you have scoop marks, open wounds, they'll fluoresce in their black light. And it wasn't very reassuring because cattle mutilations do the same thing. Well, they got a black light and they, you know, first we put it on a scar that I had on my leg didn't do anything, but as soon as we got close to those wounds that I had on my back or had on my wrist, they lit up like a Christmas tree. I tried everything. I tried a Brillo pad, I tried gasoline. That stayed under my skin for about 90 days before it finally went away. September 22nd, 2001, <clears throat> I, I needed to get away. Uh, some friends got together and um, they were having like an astronomy party. They were looking at, this is, one of our friends got this really big telescope he just got and he wanted to go try it out. I just gotten off work, this is September 22nd, 2001, and I got off work kind of late and I was headed up to this park called Daniels Park. It's south of Denver. It's, it's a nice area to go for night watching because you can see, it's high enough that you can see everything around it and it's far enough away from Denver that you can still see the pretty lights, but it's dark that you can see the stars. I drove up Daniels Park fairly late. I was headed up the dirt road <clears throat> toward the park. All of a sudden I see this red flashing light. The whole area was being lit up by this red flashing light. First thing I thought was, I have my blinker on. I shut my blinker on, the flashing kept happening. But it was real fast. And it lit up and it reminded me of the same flashing that I saw on the UFO above my work just, you know, a day or so earlier. I looked out the window and I see this UFO just almost just right above me, so close I probably could have thrown a rock at it. it scared me to the point where I thought I was going to pass out. I hit the gas. I must have been doing about 100 miles an hour up that 20 mile an hour dirt road just trying to get away from this thing. I had my camcorder with me. I took it with me, my friend said, you know, might as well start taking this with you, and it's a good thing I did. By the time I got up to the top, my friends were right there. I decided to pull over, try to videotape this thing. This thing stopped dead and suddenly shot west, slowly floating over everybody at this um, astronomy party. You know, it's interesting because one of the people in this next a uh, little video I'm going to show you, he is a physicist and he also designs software and we talked about the UFO stuff before this party and he said, you know, if I were to ever see a UFO and if it were to land, I'd be the first to go up and touch it and try to say hi. Honestly, he was the first to go running off and hiding under a picnic table. <laughs> there were a lot of witnesses. I saw a spherical... Hold on, guys. Uh, Sorry defocused, probably plasma-like object and flew from the <laughs> eastern sky to the western sky in a straight line. <coughs> it was strobing. At first you can't believe it. No, no. And then you go, wow. <laughs> and uh, it was like it was showing off for us. It was uh, round, um, light, uh, red, I mean, um, laser type thing, it was flashing. Um, it's hard to explain. It uh, wasn't a plane. It wasn't uh, um, anything I've seen before. Uh, Today's the 22nd, I believe. 
of yeah. September yeah, 2001. Second. We're in Daniels Park, south of Denver, Colorado. <laughs> and I walked over to a car. Some folks were parked over there for about 45 minutes with their parking lights on. And we asked them if they had seen it too. And they said, yes, they did. That the object was probably a uh, hundred feet or so above the outhouse that's here at the end of the parking lot. But the interesting thing in their describing it was that they said when Stan walked up, are you the guy who was driving the van? And he said, yes, I was. And so they seemed to indicate that it had followed Stan on his way here. Now, I'm showing you this stuff because one of the things that makes my case different, according to the researchers, is that most of the stuff that happens, especially lately, only seems to happen when there's a lot of people around. And I'm putting the kind of boring stuff in the beginning of this because it gets better and better and better. September 30th, 2001, just got off work again. I was in the middle of Lakewood, Colorado, during rush hour, busy intersection. A UFO came down, and I didn't know it was a UFO, and I was just about to come up to an intersection. And I see this beam of light hit the ground next to me. It would be off to my left. And, you know, because it's a big city, there's police helicopters. And like any polite citizen, you roll down your window and wave at the police helicopter that's beaming you. Well, I didn't hear any helicopter sounds. And I'm sitting there going, what? And I noticed the guy that was tailgating me had stopped in the middle of the street, gone out of his car, and was looking above my vehicle. And I'm looking, huh? And as I go through the intersection, you could see people going, I look up, and there's the same damn red blinking UFO just right above my, my vehicle, and it just beamed my van. Well, by this point, I was a little past being scared. I was kind of PO'd. This object took off, and I, got, I hit the gas. I was going to chase this thing in a van, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I tried. And this object slowly, it stopped and hovered above this cottonwood tree in a park called the Old Stonehouse Park. It slowly flew southeast. Well, there were tons of people there. Tons of people there. People had video cameras. They had digital cameras. They were having a party. Um, you could hear sirens going off. People had to have called this in. These are the people. Eventually, the news um, did a piece on this, and you can see witness reports. This is an interesting witness report. This guy was talking about seeing this object, and he said he, he was so scared he couldn't get it in reverse. And when he saw this object beam my van, the light, whatever kind of light it was, actually penetrated the metal and hit the ground below. I don't remember that. I just remember being, you know, beamed. These are some of the witness report drawings. <clears throat> That's what I thought. I thought it looked like a big soccer ball with a green thing at the bottom. Local news did a report on it. I think this is rather amazing because you get to see the other witness videos too. UFOs over Lakewood. Whoa! Tonight, right after the series finale of The X-Files on Fox 31 News, many saw it. You guys saw it too? Some with cameras rolling. There it is. See the amazing video. I want to find out what this is. And judge for yourself tonight on Fox 31 News at 9 o'clock. Thanks for staying with us on this Sunday night in the Rockies. I'm Ron Zapoma. And I'm Phil Keating. Dozens of people saw it, too, caught it on videotape, but no one's sure exactly what it is. Another unidentified flying object is seen hovering over Lakewood. This Fox 31's Kim Bosey tells us like the that. witnesses are Another. looking for answers. You can hear the excitement and anxiety in Stan Romanek's voice as he videotapes this unidentified flying object. An object he says he noticed after it spotlighted his car. I looked out my window and there's this red, red, big red blinking orb, um, probably about maybe 60 feet above my car. Stan says he followed the object with video camera in hand. That was September 30th last year at the old Stonehouse Park in Lakewood. What the hell is that thing? A park filled with people, the curious and the concerned. 
<laughs> you guys saw it too? Yes, we did. That's we all saw it. Yeah. Ever seen. Wow. This group was having a birthday party in the park. Okay. Her daughter's yelling, aliens, aliens. We thought that the kids were just playing. And then we looked up and I couldn't believe it. Jeez, I'm shaking like a leaf. <laughs> this thing was right in front of my car. It's chasing it down the road. This is what they couldn't believe. This is a second videotape. A tape of woman at the party shop. Same object, same question. Do you think it's an alien? I don't know. Numerous people reported seeing the object to the National UFO Reporting Center. Now the Mutual UFO Network is investigating. For me, on a scale of 1 to 10, this is a 13. George Zeiler is the deputy director of MUFON International, and he's heading up the investigation. He sent stamps tape to several experts for analysis. It's not an airplane. Uh, it's not a helicopter. It's not a balloon. So what is it? George isn't sure, but he's got some ideas. My opinion is that these cannot be from this planet. I would like to know where they're from. What are they doing here? Why are we of such interest to them? We or Stan. George wonders if he could be a target. Whoa! Stan saw similar objects three times that month, and weird things were happening to him birds flying into his car. He has this electromagnetic personality where he walks up to a car and all of a sudden the windshield wipers, the lights come on and the windshield wipers come on. Plus, Stan found fluorescent markings on his body. Whatever it is, it's not shy. Um, it seems to want to be recognized. If it's, you know, targeting me, I'm not anybody special. I have no idea why. February 11th, 2006. The witness came forward with some 35 millimeter pictures. Um, she found our um, address in the phone book, or actually online. Um, I guess her grandfather lived in the area, took some pictures of something he saw beaming something out in the road. And these are 35 millimeter pictures he took of this object being, beaming my van. And I put it in a little motion thing so you can kind of get an idea of what this object looks like in motion. Very bizarre. It, does, it almost looks like liquid of some kind. Really unusual. Um, June 25th, 2002. You know, I couldn't deal with this. I really couldn't deal with this. When you were such, a, if you're a big skeptic like I was, it's kind of hard for you to accept having your paradigm shifted in this way. Um, the researchers involved with me said, you know, we're going to try to get you some help. Why don't you go for a regression loan? Well, What's that? I don't even believe in regression. What's that? I decided to do it anyhow. This rocked my world probably more than seeing the UFO, honestly. I remembered from my previous experience that I had all these symbols in my head. Now, what's really important to understand is I'm severely dyslexic. I have, if I'm lucky, a fourth grade math level. I'm embarrassed to say that I have to ask my kids how to spell, which is really amazing because I have a best-selling book but I don't know how to spell worth a hell of beans and I can't do math. Well, the researcher, when she was doing her regression, said, can you remember any of these symbols? I said, yes, I can write them down. She gave me a pad of paper, my eyes closed. I'm sitting there writing these things down. I did it in like 20 seconds. That's my first equation that I wrote. What's interesting about this, the top equation ended up being according to the researchers, and they had to send this to uh, a University of uh, Nebraska physicist to get this checked out. Um, ended up being element 115. What's interesting is they didn't have element 115 when this was written. Also what's in here, I remember they showed me um, the planet alignment down there, that's where they're from, which ended up being um, somewhere in Orion's belt. Then there's our solar system, which has 10 dots in a sun as opposed to nine dots in a sun. And then a uh, formula for Drake's equation, times 100. I don't know why I wrote that, but I had put times 100 because that's what I remembered. Interestingly enough, um, two years later, somebody sent me a clip that some Russians, I think they're Russians and um, German physicist actually, or chemist actually invented element 115 two years prior, I mean two years after I wrote this. 
I had the equation for it or the uh, elemental structure for it written down out of nowhere. They didn't have this element yet. They didn't even have the uh, equation for it yet. I also remember when I was, when I was being abducted that something important was going to happen. And every time during this abduction, I'd say, when? When's this going to happen? All they'd do is flash this in my head, these dots. 1, 10, 6, 4, cheese, 9, 8. Well, so what the heck's with the cheese and what are the dots? I didn't know what it was. Well, somebody looked at it, an astronomer looked at it and said, hey, that's an alignment of planets. Cheese stands for the moon. It's like, huh? <laughs> what? Well, what's interesting, let me go back, come on, is um, the alignment actually is a date for September 21st, 2012. I do not believe in the doomsday scenario. I'm sorry. One guy went to look at a Mayan calendar, and he said, oh, the Mayans have the end of the world. You talk to the Mayan elders that are alive now, and they'll say, no, he got it wrong. It's a calendar. If anything, it's going to be a shift. It doesn't say anything about doomsday. One guy started that. That's not the case. I can guarantee you it's not the end of the world. 100% guarantee you. July 19, 2002, I was on Entertainment Tonight. This is cool because they had NASA look at that UFO. Plus, is this footage of a UFO? The man behind the alien autopsy has new footage two TV networks are interested in. Next, in the Entertainment Tonight cover story. humans who brought you the alien autopsy comes mysterious new video that could be a UFO. Our Leonard Maltin reports on Hollywood's obsession with extraterrestrials and our Entertainment Tonight cover story. I want you to understand this is probably the quintessential alien abduction slash UFO case ever on record. Well, that thing's weird. We're told this mysterious light in the sky was shot in Colorado last September. NASA's people that I'm talking to right now is saying either it's a secret military craft, surveillance of some kind, or it might be for the first time that word that we rarely use, extra-terrestrial. Did you see it too? Oh, it was incredible. Hollywood is cashing in on aliens this summer with Will Smith and a host of ETs in Men in Black 2. And opening in August, it's Mel Gibson in Signs which explores the possible supernatural origins of these crop circles. I have a basic belief in supernature, in the nature that exceeds and is higher than our own. July 27, 2002, beautiful girlfriend that I was dating, we finally got married. She's my beautiful wife now. Lisa, where are you? Lisa, stand up. I, I got to tell you, without this woman, I would be, not, I would be nobody, really. She, sub she supported me, she keeps me grounded, and she's helped me through all this stuff that I've gone through. Um, moved to Nebraska because I wanted to get away from this scary stuff. Huh, yeah. It followed me in the middle of a busy city. Why would I think that it... I should have thought about this, really. Honestly, I was happy to move in with my beautiful wife, but there's no way I could get away from this because we moved to a very small town in Nebraska. Um, woke up, noticed that our alarm clock was upside down. Didn't think anything of it. Got up and there were pens all over the floor. Also found another equation. Uh, apparently I started writing equations in my sleep. And they get more complex and more complex. Some of them are known. Some of them, they're still, even to this day, some of the top scientists or physicists are going, this is amazing, what is this? We don't understand this, and they're slowly piecing it together. November 17, 2002, I was abducted again. This time, I was left outside. Freezing weather, buck naked. All the slide bolts were locked from the inside. I had more like scrape marks on, on my back. They thought it was probably some kind of skin grafts, and I had this horrible pain in my side. It ended up being a broken rib. Now, I also had a lump in this hip right here. Now, this is important. Remember that lump. 
my wife, and it took a good half hour to wake my wife up. It's like they turn everything off when they take you. I don't know how they do it, but I was knocking at the doors, knocking at the windows. I didn't want somebody to see some freak out in the middle of the night, you know, 20 degree weather, buck naked, knocking at windows. She eventually let me in, and I was really sick to my stomach. I had this horrible taste in my mouth. I was going to throw up, and I put my hand in my mouth, and I realized that I was holding something. And I opened my hand, I dropped the substance, and it kind of floated down onto the countertop. They had the substance analyzed, and it ended up being something called elemental bismuth. Now, I found out later that this is used for electromagnetic experiments. High voltage power lines and you know, power companies use this because it's really good for it's good for non-conduction of heat, non-conduction of electricity. It's kind of used for a barrier. What am I doing with it in the wilds of Nebraska, holding it after an abduction experience? Even more bizarre, the next morning my wife wakes up and there's this weird kind of burned circle in the yard. Interesting thing about this circle is they found microscopic bits of meteorite dust in this circle. They don't know where it came from. They use an EMF meter, the EMF meter would go crazy. They use a compass, the compass would go crazy. January 5th, 2003, gets even weirder. I'd already written equations. Again, I, didn't, I refuse to believe this stuff. This is ridiculous. I can't believe this is going on. I had a dream my stepson was taken. This is when it got kind of serious for me. We were told that it wouldn't affect my stepkids. But apparently, it did. I got up, middle of the night, my wife woke up. She, said, she goes, you know, you're not going to feel good about, your, good about things. Why don't you go check on him? And I did. You know, he was about eight years old at the time. And I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so I went back to bed. Next morning, we were eating, or I was eating a donut or something. My wife was smoking, and we were drinking coffee. And we were sitting on the back deck. And I looked up, and on our window, in lipstick, was this weird symbol in this little formula. It's like, oh no, my stepson. First thing we did was we got up to check on my stepson. Well, see this weird symbol? Well, this weird symbol was above my stepson's bed. We turned around and his, in his handwriting, we see this writing in marker on the wall. It's a formula my stepson drew after he had an experience. It's his handwriting at eight years old. May 31st, 2003, you know, we were having so much stuff happen. And let me tell you, when you're a, a true abductee, you have something called high strangeness begin to happen to you. Anything and everything paranormal you can imagine. Our house was the most haunted house. Everything, flashes of lights, all kinds of things. Our furniture would disappear, re reappear. Our remote controls would disappear, reappear. The scientists said, hey, look, we gotta, we're going to hook up surveillance cameras. Um, we got to come up there. We got to buy, you know, the surveillance stuff. In the meantime, why don't you just get something kind of small and hook it up and see what happens? Well, we did. We got a motion-activated camera. We hooked our computer, and we captured this. You know, the debunkers will say, "Oh, that's a laser light." Okay, really? Okay, I want you to look at this. Look where the doorway is. And you can see that the object is actually a three-dimensional object. It stops, changes colors, and in the original video, you can see the light reflecting off the TV as its object passes by the TV. And it goes down to where we're sleeping, which is really creepy. July 17, 2003. I don't know. How many people have seen the alien in the window video that's all over? OK, raise your hand. This got me on the map. Um, I thought we had a peeping Tom. The reason I showed this video to begin with was there's something that's being started in Denver called the Denver ET Initiative. It's a ground roots effort to try to get the government to admit that ETs are real and to try to do something about it at the ground roots level. I let these people use this video for the press conference to try to get things rolling. And let me tell you, they went nuts. I was on Larry King. I've been on just, I don't know how many TV shows, how many radio shows over this video. How this video got started was, I thought we had a peeping Tom. I saw, I got up in the middle of the, um, 
well, it was late evening, let's say. I was watching TV. I got up and I see movement out of one of the windows. It's like, who's looking in our window? I ran outside and nobody was there. Next day it happened again. This was going on for about a good two, three months. I called the police. I, I let every, all the neighbors know. We set up little sticks and twigs underneath the window so if he stepped on them, we could hear him and I had a bat by the door. I have twin stepdaughters, beautiful stepdaughters. They're 21 now. They were young teenagers at the time. I thought this was some kind of pervert. Well, one of the researchers involved in my case said, hey, you got a camera. Next time you see movement outside of the window, why don't you set it up and walk away? I did. It says no video, but that's okay. It's already all over the internet. It doesn't matter. Um, I didn't go to bed, though. I went to the bathroom, sat at the edge of the bath, bathtub reading a magazine. I saw two flashes of light. After the second flash of light, I looked out, and I see this little figure pop down. It's like, yes, I got him. This, this is the video that I got. When I looked outside the window, I see this thing running away, and let me tell you, my wife thinks this is the funniest video ever, the way I react, because I jump around like a little girl, but I want you to notice at the bottom of this video. Okay. Bottom of the window. I'm just going to keep it rolling there. There's a weird little flash. Nobody knows what that is. Pause. For some reason, I'm prancing around. I don't know I why I did that. that. I, got, I have it on night shot, so it's infrared. And you'll see two flashes of light. And I'll pause it on the flashes. There's the first flash. It's kind of bright. The second flash is amazing. They said it was as bright as a the sun right outside my window. There's no sound though, that's what's amazing. Now look at the bottom of the window and I want you to notice the infrared reflecting off its retinas. He blinks, he moves its mouth, he squints, he, she, whatever it is. See him? We named him Boo. Could it be a guy in a mask? I don't think so. Could be, but I saw this thing run away with my own eyes. The debunkers will say, well, they come thousands of light years. Why are they looking in your window? How the heck should I know why they're looking in my window? I don't know. But it happens a lot. You talk to abductees and they'll tell you they have things looking in their window all the time. This is a real phenomenon. He pops up again, pops down. God, I think I saw the little bastard. They say, I saw the little bastard. I see this run away and it looks back at me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Scared the living bejesus out of me, I gotta tell you. Because its eyes were not normal. I thought it was a little kid. And then it looked back. It, it, it's like it sensed that I was there. It looked back at me. It's like, oh my God. These are the stills. We got better, you know, we got some good stills of it. September 5th, 2003, a researcher and documentary filmmaker installed surveillance cameras. They videotaped me being abducted, not directly, but they videotaped a light exploding on the side of the house. Um, by where the surveillance camera was on the side of the house. The grass looked like it started like steaming or something and these weird little bubbles started coming down and suddenly the camera got disrupted and turned off. There was a strange beeping sound that you could hear and what sounded like off in the distance like my stepson going, mom, mom. They analyzed this and found that it wasn't my stepson, it was some mechanical device that they used. They think they use this voice to wake me up and to get me to go outside looking for my stepson so they could take me. But here's a little bit of information about it. The sound is You hear that? 
and there you'll hear a beeping sound. the beeping sound at the end. Well, that audio and the video were all sent off to, and we do this purposely, any of the stuff that I have, I don't send it to people that are already involved in the UFO field because, you know, they're already jaded. We want, you know, people that don't know what this is. We don't tell them what it is, and they do their research. It's like, what is this stuff? This is amazing. So we have people other than UFO researchers do this. I had six previous samples of sounds from UFOs. Two of these samples were provided by policemen. I had four other sources from various people um, that I've accumulated over 10 years from two different countries that all six of these frequencies matched. So then I took Stan's sample and I did a analysis of that and compared that to the six previous samples I have and all seven samples match the same frequency. What he's saying is he had videos from, in audio from other UFOs people had seen all over the world, and they had that same beeping sound that I had, and it matched exactly. So that's just more evidence. What's more amazing, the next morning after my abduction experience, I got up, wanted to find out why my video camera no longer worked, and I found this. You can see, if you look, you can see a flat spot at the top because the light, whatever it was, was over the house and it hit the, uh, the gutter there. And it literally cleaned or got rid of all the mold and dirt and dust and everything all the way through the molecular structure of the siding. And it also melted and warped the siding like some kind of bizarre heat. Well, that was fine, you know. I was about to go get samples of this and sent it off to the researchers and stuff. Woke up the next morning because there was pounding outside. Now we were renting this, this uh, duplex and um, I got up and there were people outside replacing the siding. It's like, okay, something's weird go something weird's going on here. They wouldn't look at me, they wouldn't look me in the eye. I decided to get my camera. They told me they were there, the, the landlord wanted them to replace all the siding and they were there to replace the siding. They took my, my camera down, they had it nicely set on the ground, which kind of upset me because that was a real expensive um, surveillance camera. And here's me talking to them. Suddenly people showed up to do sighting of the house. Um, they said they're from the landlord. I can't get a hold of my landlord to verify it, but in any case, I think it's rather unusual that suddenly they come do the sighting. Um, so I'm going to videotape them doing the sighting and try to get them to tell me what day it is. I had the camera hidden, and I got them to tell me what date it was, so this was the day after the experience. And right in between those windows, you see him, right where he is, right above him, is where the uh, camera was. It says, Bob sighting from Grand Island, Nebraska. That's what it said on the wall. Hey, what's today's date? 8th of October. Never look at me, not once. I try to get in front of them to make them look at me and they turn away. <laughs> Kept his head down. Well, all of a sudden, I, you know, I went in, I grabbed a piece of siding. I asked them if I could take some of the siding because they had siding laying all over the ground. They said, absolutely not. You can't take one piece because we have to prove to your landlord that we did all the siding. It's like, okay, I knew something was up there. While they weren't looking, I grabbed one of the most important pieces where the camera was, took it off. There's nothing he was going to do about it. Anyhow, there's nothing he could do about it. He didn't see me. Called the landlord. The landlord was on vacation. Um, about an hour later, I heard a shop vac going. I looked out the window. They were shop vacing my yard. <laughs> what in the world? They got in their truck, drove off, waited for them to come back because the only place they replaced the siding is where I had the UFO beam my house. 
That's the only siding they ever replaced. I finally got a hold of my landlord. He said, I didn't have anybody replace your siding. We called that number that I wrote down on the side of the truck, no such thing, no Bob siding anywhere. Scientists analyzed the siding. There was a discolored area due to heat, and I don't know what caused that. October 20th, 2003, had a strange dream about squares. Just write stuff down. Um, February 13th, 2004. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, this is really important. Funniest thing, I mean, how funny can it get? You have to make fun of this or else you'll go crazy. I had a dream that my wife was being messed with. Woke up because I dreamt there were little grays shoving something down her throat while she was laying in bed. She woke up coughing. That woke me up two o'clock in the morning. I got up to go to the bathroom and I couldn't move. I was literally walking like this. It's like, what in the world? Turn on the light and I was in this woman's one piece nightgown. It's like, what the heck? My wife laughed for hours and hours and hours. She goes, that's not mine. I go, what, what is this? She goes, tell me this is yours. It was dark. She goes, I can't see anything. Turn on the light. I turn on the light. She's laughing hysterically. It's not my stepdaughter. It's not, it's not my wife. I felt a wet spot on the back of this nightgown. It was disgusting, gooey, wet spot. I didn't want it to touch my body, so we're sitting there holding it, trying to peel this thing off me. Sent it off to the researchers, to the scientists. It ended up being a blood plasma expander in a protein that they can't identify even to this day. In something that resembles a chemical that's used for in vitro fertilization. It's a medium that they suspend the egg when they introduce the sperm. It's called, if I can get this right, polyvinyl propolidone. Woohoo, I said it right. Now, what is it doing on this nightgown? Okay, this gets creepier. Um, Luckily, there's going to be a motion picture made about my story, and we're going to get funding to get this checked out for sure. But the same scientist that analyzed the Betty Hill dress analyzed this nightgown. We were contacted by Betty Hill's niece during one of these conferences, and she goes, you know, I want to talk to you about this nightgown. I heard you had a nightgown. I said, yes. She goes, well, Betty Hill died in 2003, two, uh, 2004. 2003, she had an experience, one of her last experiences, and it pissed her off because her favorite nightgown went missing. Yeah. I said, okay, well, can you describe this nightgown? She said, yes, it was a plaid nightgown with a Disney character on it. Gets even weirder. Swear to God, only happened to me. My friend for a bachelor party got me a shirt. He had it made specially. It says, I've been abducted by aliens, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. <laughs> you can't tell me those guys don't have some kind of, um, you know, I don't know. They laugh about the stuff they do to me. They have to. Um, but the shirt, I went to bed with that shirt and it ended up missing. What's interesting is uh, when Betty Hill's niece went over, they, they found this shirt that says I've been abducted by aliens and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Unfortunately, Betty Hill thought she got it from one of these conferences. Supposedly, she has a picture of it. She took, when Betty Hill died, unfortunately, she took everything to the Goodwill and we have no way of doing that. But I still have the nightgown and if the DNA matches, I. I'm telling you, this is really big. Now, also, remember that lump in my hip? There's now three puncture marks around that lump in my hip. It's very important. We were having so much stuff happen. We were being harassed. Um, we found uh, my phone was being tapped. There were you know, black SUVs following us. We decided to move out of Nebraska. Didn't really tell anybody. But suddenly, a strange woman in that same black SUV pulled up to our mailbox, 
and she put a letter in there. And it says, um, good luck on your move to Colorado and remember we're watching. It's like, how the heck did they know we were? She put 40 bucks in this card. So you intelligence guys out there, way to go. That was really cool. Give us more money. June 11, 2004, we moved to Colorado Springs. This is really weird. This gets weird. Um, Colorado Springs, I love, I, I was going to be an Olympic cyclist. I lived in Colorado Springs training there for a while. Loved the area. Beautiful, beautiful area. Um, but there's a lot of military bases, secret military bases I didn't know about. Um, we were warned by a strange mechanical voice. This voice has been with us ever since my experience has started. At first we thought this voice was somebody playing a joke. Um, Alejandro, who now works for Opens, Open Minds, has been a, one of the lead investigators involved in my case for a long time. He's moved out to uh, Phoenix from Denver and he can't be around my case too much anymore, but he's a really good friend. He found the same voice on a text-to-speech program and the name of the voice is Audrey, so we call this voice Audrey. It was fine when it first started leaving, message, leaving messages on our answering machine, but eventually we got to talk to her in person. Two hour conversations, one on one, proves that this isn't just any ordinary text to speak. You can't type that fast. And this voice morphs, and this voice will tell you the future, and this voice warns us if something happens. Sometimes it does stuff that just absolutely blows your mind, but this is the first odd recall we got. Okay, Lisa, hit the button. One old message. Hello, Stan and Lisa. My intention is not to scare or alarm you, but to warn you. It is great that you are back in Colorado, but Colorado Springs was not a good idea. It seems you have moved into their backyard. Now it is easy for them to get to you. I know how stubborn you are, Starseed, but please heed this warning and know that Lisa and the children are at risk also. Now listen, Starseed. You know you are different. Follow your instincts and stay alert. This is too important. Soon it will all be revealed. And Starseed, do not be afraid of what you are. What the, what the heck is Starseed? I, I, I thought that was really bizarre. I know now, but that, that's what they always call me. Um, August 9, 2004, my stepdaughter got a new camera, took pictures. Very beautiful pictures of the clouds. I put it on my desktop and noticed something. Like, what in the world? She had a fit. She goes, this is your baloney. I don't want this camera. And you take it back. You know, teenagers, they don't like stuff like that, anything that makes them look uncool. Well, she's got a, she's got a twin sister. Her sister goes, I want to take pictures of UFOs. So she went out taking pictures. She wasn't going to download them until the next morning. Put the camera by the computer. We found the camera on the floor. It had two extra pictures on it. I'm going to let you look at this picture for a while. Do you see the eyes? This is the next picture. Now do you see the eye, the nostril, and the mouth at the bottom? Yep, we call this one Curious George. It <laughs> took a, accident, I think, we think it took, actually accidentally took a picture of itself and dropped the camera. <laughs> August 13, 2004, I felt something sharp poking out of that strange lump in my hip. Remember that lump in my hip? It's a little sliver. Start poking out. Took it to the doctor. Doctor said, I don't know what it is. Looked at it in an x-ray. We can see it, but it's probably a fatty deposit. When it was taken out, it had fuzz all over it. And the fuzz, once it hit there, it looked like you know white mold fuzz. I don't know how else to explain it. But once it hit there, it started melting, started liquefying. Cleaned it up, put it in a test tube, took it home, called the researchers. They said, oh my god, you have, a, you have an implant. It's like, huh? Well, you, you know, take all kinds of pictures of it, videotape it under different lighting conditions, and then hide it. Well, we did. We videotaped it, took pictures of it under regular light, under black light. Interesting thing, under black light, the darn thing turned orange. We shot off the black light, the damn thing still glowed orange. My wife was in charge of hiding it. I didn't know where she hid it. I went to bed, we went to bed um, that evening, and I hear this high-pitched squeal coming out of this 
the radio next to my bed. I woke up the next morning, told my wife about it. She goes, oh, no, the implant. She hit the implant in the test tube in the back of the battery compartment. We took the battery compartment, opened the battery compartment, and we found that the implant in the, the bottom of the test tube were blown to bits. This is how small those pieces are. This is really kind of cool, actually. Um, this was sent to Cal Berkeley. When we sent it, we sent it in a sterile jar. By the time it got to Cal Berkeley, it had made a teaspoon of its own amino acid, something that they're still trying to identify. Um, it was blown apart, they figured out, by high-frequency sound. Remember those little hairs I told you about? There's evidence of those little hairs. Even more amazing, these tiny, tiny, almost virus-sized microscopic computer chips, they think. Tiny microscopic gears in this little... They determined that it is a, some kind of biological nanotechnology that we don't have, and it totally flipped them out. December 20, 2004. It got real for me. And this is probably why Audrey called. We were getting broken into all the time. We had surveillance cameras. Our surveillance was being ha cut. Um, there were police helicopters following us everywhere we go, everywhere we went. I worked pretty close to home. I rode my bike. Didn't really need to drive my car. I had four guys in a black unmarked SUV pull up, started saying something to me, but because we were um, behind other cars stop stopped at a stoplight, I just ignored them. I thought they were drunk soldiers. Well, it turns out they knew exactly where I parked my bike. They had to have cased the area because I parked my bike behind my work. They cut me off and they told me, they said, you need to keep your mouth shut. I said, I didn't say anything to you. They said, you know what we're talking about. And they, I could hear them talking about the ET stuff. I said, you know, look guys, this isn't my fault. I'm not gonna stop talking about it. We got in a fight. They started doing their karate kung fu moves on me. I had a big chain that I wrapped around the seat of my bike, and I hit one of them on the head, and I, I hope I didn't kill him, but I knocked him out. I felt a tickle on my back, and I hit the dirt. They actually tased me. By the time the, pol the police got there instantaneously, people were driving by as this was happening. They, one guy even tried to follow this black SUV, but they sped away. This is what I ended up with, a broken nose and a broken wrist from the experience. January 24, 2005, startled awake by a high-pitched sound. Remember that weird orb we saw in our video, I mean in that surveillance video? This time I saw it with my own eyes three feet from my head when I woke up and I went, oh, I swore, I went, oh, crap. And the thing just darted out the room. I got my video camera and I went looking for it. And it is. Can't see it very You'll well. see it come from the left bottom to the right upper very fast, and I slow it down. And then it comes back about the opposite 12. direction, kind of slow. See it? And I have no clue what I just saw. None whatsoever. Holy I don't know what that thing was, but I saw it with my own eyes and I go, Where? Crap, crap, what is that? What the hell was that? Well, I realized that I had surveillance surrounding the house. I looked at the surveillance video, and this is what the surveillance camera picked up. Now it goes in the house, comes out the side, out the wood, and weaves in and out of the, like it's, like it's some, the wood's fabric or something. It's the craziest thing, and it disappears, disrupts the camera, ends up in the top window, comes down through the wood of the side of the house, and just, it's just weird. Um, February 19th, 2005, our mis van mysteriously broke down. We were coming back from Colorado Springs to Denver, about 80 miles. We stopped at a hamburger place. This white car drove by very slowly and suddenly our car stopped. Two hours later, we got it to a mechanic. He said, Did you, was your car hit by lightning? It's like, how could it be? It's a sunny day out. He said, it looks like your, all your electrical system was fried. This is important. Now, I wish to, I'm not gonna show you the video because there's going to be in fact, I'm going to have them come up briefly, talk about what they're doing with the documentary or with the feature film. 
but they're going to show this in the documentary. I sh I'm showing you stills, but the video is quite amazing. My stepson had friends over, and they hacked into my computer. My computer was always being hacked into, and it was about 12 o'clock at night, I'd say, and I woke up because I heard a noise, and I'm you know, opening my eye, just sitting there, and I see this naked figure running into the kitchen. My stepson had friends over sleeping over. I'm thinking, what in the world kind of dare is this? I was going to get my camera and blackmail him. You should see the video. It's quite, quite astonishing. I was just about to shut off the video. I went upstairs to their bedroom. They were still asleep. They said, something woke us up. We don't know what it was, and they were still kind of half asleep, half awake. I was just about to shut off my, my camcorder, and I see this thing peering at me. It closes its eyes, ducks down a little bit, and slowly moves away. Here, I'll do it again so you can see it. Closes its eyes, ducks down, and slowly moves away. I went from the kitchen to the dining room, back to the kitchen, back to the dining room. When I go to the kitchen the last time, there are five flashes of lights on the windowsill. I woke up on the ground 45 minutes later, the same time my camera started back by itself, started up by itself. Only remember seeing flashes of lights. I had no idea that I just seen, had an experience with the little guy. I had to look on the videotape to remember what happened, and I still kind of don't remember. My surveillance cameras didn't work. Couldn't figure out why. It's like, yes, we got, some, we got one of them on camera. Well, I went to go check out these $500 a piece VCRs that were installed, and there was a burn mark in the top of the first one, in the bottom, into the next one, through the cupboard, out the side. We don't know how they did it, but we opened the VCR, and see that top left one? There's a little kind of blob. That's a ceramic diode. Ceramics usually blow up at about 1,000 degrees, something like that. This is melted. How in the world do they do that? March 11, 2005, we received a greeting card or an envelope with a warning from Colorado Springs somewhere. It says, in their daily lives, all are braver than they know. Good luck. I've got to find my glasses wherever they are, or else I can't read this thing. It says, we have, gone to, we have gone to great expense getting this to you. Maybe now you will believe that you must move. Do not release this to the public or contact anyone involved for your safety and ours. There's a government document with my name on it, top secret document. Department of Air Force Intelligence, be advised. We expect Romanek to have a visitor soon. We will try our best not to miss it this time. Their closeness proximity is convenient to say the least. Also, HPM worked van incapacitated. Mr. Romanek is smart and has, is stubborn and has a strong support system. It also seems that he is getting inside help. We will investigate. If Romanek stays at location, HPM can be used on residents and on parties involved if available. As you know, subject must be in range and we will follow up as things unfold, but follow is spelled fallow. It's misspelled. Being dyslexic, I had no clue it was misspelled. But I thought this was a fake until I found out that HPM stands for high powered microwave, and that's what they hit my van with. That's what they remember I, my van died. Well, apparently they were using it on our residents, too. And this is the result. And if I would have been smart, I would have got out of there because every time this would happen, my feelings, our feelings would heat up. But the speakers in our house, even if they weren't plugged in, would go off periodically. Okay, today is May 5th, 2005. Um, we have problems with our speakers buzzing all the time. And I wanted to let you see in here for yourself. This is our speaker. And that's, the speakers are off, completely off, there's no light. Go to the other one. Can you see? I don't know what the hell's causing all the speakers to go off like this. Alright, I'll go downstairs so you can hear the speakers downstairs.
no matter where you went in the house, this had happened. Even though speakers that were complete, my stepdaughter had a ghetto blaster that was and in the top of the dumb park, and it was doing it with that. And it's the not higher on. you get There's in the house, it's the louder off. it got. Okay, I'm and go I go up to the upstairs bedroom, and I want you to hear the room. pattern of this thing. Let's get this really the power good. goes out, because the power usually goes out. All right. This is, you can already hear it, it's really loud. That's. They were hitting our house with high-powered microwaves. Bastards. May 9th, 2005, that orb returned. This guy, I th honestly, I think it's some kind of surveillance. I caught it playing in our crab apple tree. I was just talking to Nancy. Where'd it go? There it is. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. I might have to turn this up. A That's the same freaking orb. I gotta go over here and see if I can get it better. Where'd it go? Oh my god. There's a fox out there too. That is the craziest freaking thing. Just sitting That's there. the same damn orb. Obviously it wasn't afraid of my head when Maybe I was Maybe it sleeping. wasn't a fox. Maybe it I was just something just talking disguised. to Nancy. It's about 1230 um, May 8th. Well, it'd be May 9th, 2005, I guess. That is the craziest thing. <gasps> there it is. There it is. There it is. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in. Don't know what it is. That's around a lot. You know, I have all this stuff analyzed by, you know, some of the top people there is. I did the video analysis on a frame-by-frame -frame basis of the Stam Romanek footage, and I see absolutely uh, no evidence of, of uh, post-production effects applied to the footage. So that means that all of it was shot in camera. Now, if that's the case, uh, it would take an awful lot of expense to pull off this elaborate, uh, uh, this elaborate set of shots. And if it's not a fake, it's undoubtedly the most important footage I've ever seen. July 14, 2005, more unexplained things start happening. Our house became haunted like you can't believe. One of the people involved in my case um, got some ghost hunters to come to our house. How many people here don't know what an EVP is? Raise your hand. Okay, for those of you that don't know what an EVP is, it stands for Electronic Voice Phenomena. If you're a ghost hunter, you will have a digital, cam uh, digital recorder with you. They will ask questions to midair, and sometimes they get answers that they can't hear on these little recorders. Well, we had this little tape recorder in the middle of our kitchen table. And didn't think anything of it till later. The researchers, you know, we were listening to this camcorder, or I mean this tape re recorder, and we picked up this weird sound coming off this tape recorder, an EVP. <laughs> My wife screamed and goes, oh my God, we have demons. <laughs> well, the researcher says it looks like it's, because a lot of times what will happen, it, it, it'll either be slowed down, sped up, or compressed, and they have to work with it to kind of get it cleaned up. This is what it actually said. They sped it up. Starseed, it's time. Remember that Audrey phone call? How in the world did she get it on this thing that was in the middle of the table? August 1st, 2005, we got tired of the harassment in Colorado Springs, so we moved. We should have listened to Audrey in the first place. August 17th, 2005, wrote more equations in my sleep. They get more complex, more complex. September 27, 2005, heard a noise out in the backyard. You know, this happened all the time. We'd have all kinds of stuff happen. Our, our lawn furniture would disappear. We'd go outside, couldn't find it, 
and we were just out there 10 minutes ago. It was fine. And all of a sudden, we go out there again, and our lawn furniture is gone. It's out in the yard. Well, this was one of those cases. There's Lisa in her bathrobe. She's drinking coffee, smoking outside. She doesn't smoke inside. I took some pictures, and you know there's this debate about orbs. I personally, some of them I think are really something. A lot of them are just dust speck. The only trouble is a lot of the orbs we get have faces in them, and this is not matrixing. And this happens over and over again. So there's something to it. The only thing is, is there's something else we kept, got a picture of. I'll let you look for a little bit, see if you can spot the thing. OK, there you go. There's another one. I'll let you see if you can spot it this time. Do you see them? Let me see if I can get this thing working. Right, is this on? Yeah, right there. October 5th, 2005, heard a noise outside again. Lawn furniture was missing. Couldn't find it anywhere. The little son of a gun put it on our roof. We had to leave it on our roof. We had no ladder to get up there. The neighbors would walk by and go, what in the world is your chair? We had to say some kids played this prank. We had no other way to explain it. November 21st, 2005, we're invited to, uh, we invited some friends over for Thanksgiving. One of the researchers involved in my case is ex-Naval uh, Intelligence. He was a, uh, not a congressman, but uh, he did something in politics. Uh, I don't know, but really good researcher. And I told him, I said, you know, um, here, let me go back because I don't want to start it yet. We, have a, we had a computer, a computer in our room. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I hear this click, 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 and I see the chair move. I'm, I thought I was dreaming, and I told my friend, our, you know, the researcher about it. And he was over for Thanksgiving. It was pretty late at night. We were having dessert. He set up his camcorder, and he dared them to do something. Well, you can actually hear the click, 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 but I want you to see, watch the office chair or the desk chair. <laughs> hear the clicking. Yeah. yeah. Well, our, you know, the researcher, he's so polite. We see that this happened, and everybody's just so excited. He sets up the camera again. He goes, well, just listen to him. It's funny. Again, have a ball. Get playful. Be silly. Move a few things around by the computer. That was just great. Just enjoy your presence. It's funny because they don't move the chair. You'll see this, and I pause it. You see this little orb, and I pause it. Could be dust. I'm not sure. Nobody's in the room. Everybody's out. We made sure that we went in there in pairs to make sure nobody was doing anything. They didn't move the chair. <laughs> they moved his camera. His camera was tightened down. Somebody had to put some force into that. December 16, 2005, girls kept seeing shadows. Move around the house. I videotape one. Mark, enter into the room. No, the camera's not on. I, I don't want you to focus yeah. on anything in particular. Just shadow, look Mark? at the whole thing and you'll Saw see it. Yeah, I think I might have gotten it on film. Let's see it go zooming by. February 28th, 2006, her, Lisa, my wife heard me talking in my sleep. She got to witness me write this equation. This is probably one of the most complex equations. The scientists are saying this talks about bending time space. What's interesting is they couldn't read it, they couldn't figure out why until one of the researchers held it up to a mirror. I wrote it backwards. The point I'm trying to make is, these are not just letters that, that are written on a piece of paper. Stan wrote them down, he really didn't know what they meant, but they do mean something. He could not have written them himself, I, I couldn't have written this one myself. Whoever wrote this and put it in Stan's, I guess I'm beyond trying to prove that it's not a hoax, it's not a hoax, and uh, I could not have come up with this myself, so I don't think Stan could have either. What these equations show is how we can use electromagnetism to warp space and time. These are equations that Stan could never have come up with 
on his own. I can't even do long division. Isn't that sad? <laughs> May 4, 2006, this, is, this was important for me anyhow. I felt a little better about things. Um, I was painting the eave of a house, of our house, fell off, tore the anterior cruciate ligament in a hamstring. I was supposed to go to surgery that next Wednesday. Tuesday, and there's the documentation that I really did have this injury. Tuesday, I went on a little trip. Lisa woke up. As typical with most of my abduction experiences, they somehow will blow all the fuses in our house, and our house is completely dark. Lisa woke up, and I was gone, and the fuses were blown, and she couldn't find me anywhere. She eventually got everything um, back on, and she found me in the middle of the living room, and, you know, we just went to bed. We were both kind of confused. Don't know why I just went back to bed. My wife got up the next morning to go to work um, and found this circle in our yard, concentric rings. What's interesting, this was about 6 o'clock in the morning. By 5 o'clock that evening, that circle died to this. Again, microscopic bits of meteorite dust. She woke me up to come look at this circle, and I got up. Now, I went to bed with a brace on. The brace was from my hip down to my, to my ankle. It had little dials here because I was supposed to get surgery. My, my knee was swelled up to the size of a grapefruit. I get up, and I'm walking around, and I go, wow, that is the coolest. What happened? And I remembered that something happened that night. And Lisa goes, well, do you notice anything different? I go, no. She goes, what happened to your brace? I go, wow, my brace is missing. Then I realized that I had no pain in my leg. There was no swelling in my leg. I looked at my leg. There were five puncture marks in the back of my leg. Whatever they did, they fixed my knee. We found my brace on the side of the house. It had been burned to almost unrecognizable. Pieces of it were thrown in the field behind our house. Some of it was on top of the swing set, like it was thrown from a high distance. <laughs> I like this one the best. I had to explain to the doctor why I didn't need surgery. <laughs> this is real. This is all documented. She goes, I know you're afraid. She goes, if you don't get your knee fixed, you're going to be a cripple the rest of your life. It's like, you don't understand. I can't explain it to you. I'm just going to have to show you. She goes, well, I'll tell you what. I'm not, I'm not there right now, but my associate's at the emergency room. Just go take it to him. My right wife recorded the whole thing. I woke up at 3 o'clock. The swimming was gone. The breathing was gone. Everything was gone. And I could run up and down stairs. It was the creepiest thing. So if you lose power when you're sick, the next time they have things will be fine? I hope so. <laughs> we don't know. It's just really on. We don't know. But where did you get the holes? It's, it's a pattern, right? I mean, it's right in the line. It was there when I woke up at 3 o'clock. She woke up because the lights were out, I guess. I, 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 I couldn't find it. You get up and sleep a lot? No. We don't know what's going on. So. She went out to uh, turn on, I guess, the stereo. She went out to turn on the lights, and then I was in the living room wondering where she went. Well, I don't know what those, you know, those leases are on your leg, I mean, but there's such a pattern that this, you know, it's hard for me to, to cover this from any, you know, insect or anything like that. Or more likely, I don't know, it could be the pressure, there's no rivets or anything on that immobilizer. But the immobilizer's gone, it just disappeared. I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, it just disappeared. It's, it's gone. gone. You were in Yes, I did. <laughs> I went to bed, it's gone, we looked everywhere for it. Where do you live? <laughs> yeah. I want to go and visit you. <laughs> I, don't live, I don't know, but anyway, your exam is fine today. I wouldn't do anything. Well, I don't know, other than calling Ghostbusters, I think we just go out of business. Well, he's got ghosts in his house, and they stole the moon mobilizer and the holes in his leg, and everything's mine, he's going to be on that. Nobody can explain it. Hey, save that's the hospital bill. Yeah. You know, nobody can explain it. Is Dr. Young going to do satellite ACL repair? Now everything's going to find it. You know what I'd do? I would go home, do your normal routines. Big mystery, I don't know. Yeah, that's what we thought. It's like, this is so weird. I still think you ought to call Ghostbusters. <laughs> I don't think there is a Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. I don't know what else to do. 
maybe thinking you guys can shed some light on this. But. And they got I didn't tell him anything about what happened. I just told him I didn't need my, I don't know where he got Ghostbusters from. Uh, hopefully I got this. So it's uh, May 22nd, 2006. Uh, this happens all the time. I have so much, these guys follow us wherever we go. Um, where we live now, a helicopter hovered about 100 feet above the neighbor's house and there's a camera sticking out of the window of the neighbor's house. This happens to us all the time. The black helicopter thing is a real thing. I mean, it really happens. July 3rd, 2006, a friend invited Lisa and I to a fireworks show in Colorado. And we were messing around and we were telling, he was telling everybody he's a, he was a, a producer that wanted to do my show, uh, do my uh, story about me a long time ago. And he's telling his friends, he goes, every time they take pictures, there's something in them. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Here's a fireworks show. Lisa took a picture off over here. I don't remember if she heard something or not. And there's this cool orb. And I put it on my computer and I looked, it's like there's some kind in the background. What in the world? Now you gotta understand, I think I believe those are corn stalks, and they're about that tall. Might be wheat. Lisa, was it corn or wheat? Just a field, just a regular field. I don't know what the heck they are, but there they are. Um, September 28th, 2006, Lisa woke, woke up, found me writing again. This time we had friends over. They watched me do it. People watched me do this. I, I guess I was saying things like, there's not enough room. Um, I don't understand. And I'm sitting there with my eyes closed going, What's interesting about this equation is the bottom part. When this was sent to Dr. Jack Cash or University of Nebraska, he said, you know, it looks like some kind of weird language. Let's send it to our language department. They said, yes, but we don't know much about it. Send it to the University of Oregon. They said, you know, it's, it looks like some kind of Middle Eastern ancient language. Sure enough, the researcher Alejandro looked it up. It ended up being a form of Aramaic that was spoken in the time of Jesus. I don't, there's, I don't know what the connection is, but it's the word propulsion. And if you look, there is a zero and a period, and it ended up being zero point propulsion. They were telling us what they were giving us. It talks about zero point propulsion, which, what the heck? Why would I do this? And they watched me write this in my sleep. Jan January 15, 2007, a high pitched sound shattered my stepson's glass. Um, can you guys maybe turn this up a little bit? Some people can hear this, some people can't. You ready? Uh, there's a ring that I can't figure out where it's coming from, and I'm going to try to see if I can pick it up, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to walk away now and see if I can get it to stop. Okay. How many people heard that? Raise your hand. Now, see, some people could hear it, some people can't. It's really bizarre. That's the sound. I've got some limited time. I'm going to have to blow through these. July 4th, we had some friends over for a barbecue. We see something outside the window. We chase it. It ended up being a gray. I took pictures of it. It was hiding in the background. We were at the UFO Watchtower doing a conference. Um, Paula Harris was there. Wherever I go, these things follow me. Usually when there's a big crowd, they'll, they'll show up. Um, we all watch these UFOs. These two came together, split apart. Um, my stepson got a birthday card. It ended up being a haunted birthday card. He opened it up, it plays music. And we kept finding this in the middle of nowhere and he'd start playing music. So I put it on the table, put a piece of tape down so if it moved, I could see that it moved and watch it. My camera mysteriously disappears. My wife finds it, comes back with these pictures on it. I don't think this thing looks harmful. I want to hug it. I think it's awesome looking. Real strong neck, though. 
Um, April 25th, 2008, thought an airplane was going to crash into our house, saw it come tumbling through the sky. It stopped, started floating north. Cats were hissing at something up on the stairs. All I saw was a shimmer of light. Took a picture of it. It seemed to absorb the light. It happened again. I looked outside. I see this. I hear this, doo -doo 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 -doo, this weird sound. And I look outside from my office into the family room, and my remote control is floating in midair. Get my camera. I see the shimmer. Take a picture. Look, there's a shadow thing holding my remote. That's my remote, just right above the. Right, there's the remote, there's the shadow thing. It happens again. This time the cat's playing with it. There's the cat right there. There's, and look, the shadow's casting a shadow. Jumps up and it kind of disappears. Ghost hunters come over to visit. Are there less than five of you here? We had an EMF Thank meter, you. and I don't have time to show you Thank all you of them. Much. I don't want to miss the real important part. Um, but we were playing Are with this EMF meter, and it was actually or less here us through this EMF you? meter. August 3rd, 2008, woke up with yet another implant. Puncture mark here. The implant moved. It was here on my chest. It moved from here to my armpit in seven days. And every time you put a cell phone up to it, it'd go bee. September 2nd, 2008, snapped a picture of a UFO outside my office window. It did it through the screen, so it's kind of hard to, you can see the screen more than you can see the UFO. Um, September 12th, 2008, staring at, um, staying at a friend's cabin, had some missing time. That's when they took the implant out. You can see where it ended up. Everybody had missing time then, fluoresced under black light. November 17, 2008, a new administrator at Lisa's work. She had no idea what she was doing. Um, Lisa couldn't stand her, and Lisa was going to quit. We got a call from Audrey. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Okay. She's not leave her employment. All will be dealt with today. Things will be much easier for her. Okay, so should I let her know? Hello? 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 Later that day, Lisa's boss was fired by upper management and escorted out of the building. Nobody knows why. This is the kind of pull that Audrey voice has. December 6, 2008, strange phone call made me pass out. You know what, I'm not going to have time to show you this. I can show you out there if you want to see it. Or if I have time, I'll come back because I want to be able to answer questions. But i um, got a strange call. This Audrey voice will call everybody, and it'll be your own, uh, caller ID, your own phone number on the caller ID. You'll pick it up, and it'll ring, and then it'll reach one of the other researchers involved in the group. It'll ring again, and it'll be somebody else. There were three people, and all of a sudden this call, this weird, voice, uh, weird sound comes over, and it made me pass out. And I'll play, I have to, you know, I'll play it in. Okay, Audrey's getting us all on together. Hello? Hey. Hey, honey, Audrey, it's Audrey. Yeah, Audrey just connected all of us. Huh? Audrey just connected all of us. It seems like one of those days where we get to play phone games again. Yeah. So, Audrey, is there something that you want to say to us? Stan, are you there? Maybe she's... Yeah, I'm here. I don't hear anything, though, so... Why would she what, Stan? I keep hearing, like, some weird-ass thing in the background. Like a mumbling. Something. Yeah. Are you still there, Heidi? Yes, I am. What the hell is that? I don't know. 
That was really a neat sound. <laughs> you hear that, Stan? Well, just stay on. How do you feel? Yeah, that's when I passed out. That's how I Hello? feel. Hello? Heidi, I'm here. Did we lose him? Stan? Let me bring Stan back in, okay, Heidi? Okay. Hang on. Okay. Are you there, Heidi? Yeah. Okay. Hello? Hey, April, is Stan there? Um, yeah, he's on the floor. He passed up. Holy She sounds shit. concerned, doesn't that she? Sound made him pass. That, uh, May 27, 2009, this, is gonna ma this makes me emotional. I remember during my abduction experiences, one of the, and honestly, guys, I, I don't have time. I, I could do this for weeks. Get my book. It has a lot of stuff in it. I'm selling it here. But um, I remember seeing little kids during one of my abduction experiences, and some of them looked like me. Some of them were more human than not. Um, we catch a little girl. I was out in my backyard taking pictures of our cats. We had already had an experience with one of these little girls showing up at a book release party that I had. I was taking pictures of the cats and I see this little girl stand up and go running out the gate. We looked and she was picking flowers in my backyard. She disappeared into nowhere. I mean, literally just disappear. I'll let you look for a little bit. Look at the bottom part, and you can see her looking through the gates. We've gotten a call from these little kids calling me daddy. Um, there are three women involved in my story. Um, my wife, our friend Victoria, who became a friend because I recognized her from an abduction experience, and our friend Heidi. Apparently, there are children out there from my experiences. There are nine of them, and this is one of them. She grabbed the flowers, took off, ran outside the gate. When I looked outside, she left us a little bouquet of flowers on the front step. There was another incident where we were um, playing with the camera, and I see this, mo this figure standing outside. She's looking in the window. This one doesn't look very human at all. But I go out and chase her, and she runs away. It's raining outside, but she leaves a footprint. That's the size of her footprint. And see, there's flowers all around. The interesting thing about that uh, footprint, this happened last summer, is in Colorado it gets cold. It snows. It freezes. There's the front of our house. The flowers in that area are still alive. They will not die, even in below freezing weather, where she stepped. Another UFO outside my office window, while talking on the phone, a little girl calls us. Oh, now you're going to understand, you can hear, unfortunately, my friend, we carry tape recorders with us wherever we go. We get a call and um, we record anything right away, especially if it comes from numbers, mysterious phone numbers. And we got a call from this little girl saying that her name is Kioma. There's uh, nine altogether, seven from the same, two each one with different. And her name's Kioma and the other girl's name is Trilly. So 
There are hybrid kids out there. We've seen them. Three times we've seen them. They're amazing. They're angelic. Um, you see them with your own eyes. You see them in pictures. It will make you weep. There's like an angelic quality that's just amazing about these children. Now that slowed down voice you heard, heard in there, researchers isolated it. Somebody was there when she was recording it. And they said, can you hear with that, can they record with that device? And another voice answered, yes, they can. Heard a loud noise, next room. Plant was knocked over. This was just recently, took a picture. Actually, I went down and there was a dark mass from the floor to the ceiling rocking back and forth. Scared the crap out of me. Went upstairs, came back down with the camera and my wife, because she can protect me, I thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a wuss, what can I say? There's a black mass. If you notice, one of the things the researchers notice is that straight edge warps around that picture. So they have some kind of light bending technology, they think. We've got, I'm going to have one of the people from the documentary um, film, the producers and the people working with me, come up just briefly, kind of explain what they're doing. This has been the, I've been trying to get, you know, there have been many people trying to do a film on my case for so long and finally it's getting done. Let's have you come up and his name's Jack and this is John. These are the guys that are going to be doing this. Finally, we're going to go around the back. We've got like 13 minutes, so let's have you step up and you're talking to my tie. I hate getting close to Stan. I never know what's going to happen. So, um, uh, uh, real quickly, I want Stan's going to finish up here. But my name is Jack Roth. Uh, this is John Semple. And uh, our other uh, amigo over there is Patrick Burke. And we're with Trent Hall Media Group. Um, it's an interesting story about how we met Stan, but I was actually introduced to his case through Alejandro. And I was shown some evidence, in particular the, the, uh, some of the photos that you have seen here. And as you can see, there's a lot to this case. Um, we realized very quickly, one of the, it's touching, it really is. And what we really wanted to, to, to do was we realized how important it was to document this entire story. Because bits and pieces had been on TV. And it didn't come, come across very well because when you just see one thing, uh, sometimes it seems like it's too good to be true. But this is an incredible case and it's important. Thank you. I found a mic. Yeah, that's much better. It's Can you hear me? No. Test. Test. No, okay, working. good. Okay. Um, this is an important story and it needs to be told correctly. Um, and that's, that's our purpose. We really feel like we need to tell this story in its entirety. We need to tell it truthfully. We need to tell it accurately. Um, everything, no stone will be left unturned. We're going to analyze everything. We're going to talk to everyone. We have a, an enormous amount of work to do because we're in pre-production right now. We have to go through. This is only about 20 percent, maybe 25 oh, less than that. Of, of, of all the evidence and everything that's happened. So um, our time schedule is uh, probably about a year from now you will see this film. And it will be a feature-length documentary, and it will be, um, it will have everything, everything in it, uh, from beginning to end. And I want John. John's the director, so I want him to just really briefly uh, talk about our vision for this. One of the things I think that is unusual about this case is the depth and breadth of everything that has happened. And, and I was very interested in watching the room as certain images were put up on the screen, and you all reacted the same way that we did when we first saw a lot of this presentation in December. And it's an emotional response. And I think that one of the things that we really want to get across in this is, sure, the evidence. Because you know, one of the things that I, I think is important about this is You've seen documentaries, you've seen television shows where they show the footage, they show the pictures, and there's a tremendous focus on that. But rarely ever do you see a focus on the individual or the individual's families and the impact that it has on them emotionally. So a big part of what we're going to be doing with this story is delving into Stan's psyche, into Lisa's psyche, the family's psyche, to really try to understand the emotional journey that they've gone on because I doubt anybody in this room would raise their hand right now and say, I want to go through what Stan has gone through for the last 10 years. 
And how many people here would be interested in finding more about how Stan has felt through this process, what the emotional journey has been, how it's impacted him and his family? Stan stands up here and, and makes light of it, but this is the reaction to what you saw is something I think more people need to see. And if we just show it just as images and pictures and clips like this, people may find their ways to debunk it. We want to try to tell a story that's an emotional story, that's filled with facts, it's filled with verification and validation, but it also tells a story about a family of people who have had their lives turned upside down by an unfortunate and, and unusual occurrence within their life. And we're really excited about having the opportunity to do that. And what we really want everybody in this room to do is to tell people about this story, prepare them for what's going to come, which is the film. And when the film comes out, we want it to reach a bigger audience so that people can see that this is something that is happening and is having an emotional impact on people like Stan and hundreds of thousands of other people throughout the world are having similar experiences. And we just think this just needs to get out there. So we, we're work in progress. So, but just, uh, just remember Stan's name and, and it will be attached to the story. So keep your eyes peeled for it. Uh, there, our website, trenthallmedia.com, is going to have updates on this as we produce it. And, and we're going to be doing blogs to keep people posted. And from time to time, may even have an opportunity to include some, some uh, video footage of the process of making the film. So stay tuned. Let people know about it. We're really excited about getting this story to the masses and hope you will help spread the word. And it'll be on my website, too. And let me tell you, people that get involved in my case, have experiences. They aren't the exception. Everybody that gets involved in my case gets to see stuff. Um, I do have a book out there, guys. It's um, a bestseller, amazingly enough. Come on, there it is. Even though I'm dyslexic, I seem to have written a best-selling book, which is baffling to me, but I'm, I have it for sale here. Um, you can go to my website www.stanromanek.com, find out where I'm speaking. Um, and, you know, thank you guys. If you, I don't have time for questions, really. I'll be out there signing books if you have questions. Thank you so much. Okay, Stan Romanock. Stan is going to meet with... Uh, Stan is going to be out in the big uh, lobby author table out there to meet with all of you, and uh, he will look forward to.